Hi, welcome back to uh, the Breaking Bad Insider Podcast. My name is Kelly Dixon. I'm one of the editors of the new hit show, uh, Breaking Bad, on the AMC Network. And I'm here today to discuss episode number 208, uh, entitled... Better Call Saul. <laughs> better, better Call Saul. I'm here with my executive producer, Vince Gilligan, and the writer of that episode, Peter Gould. Hey. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey, how you doing, Kelly? So, um, <laughs> I guess uh, we should start in uh, right away about... Uh, I know that uh, we have a new character, uh, played by Bob Odenkirk. Yeah. We get to Saul Goodman, who is uh, Walt's new uh, consigliere in the classic Godfather sense. He's going to be uh, the, the criminal lawyer who's going to defend, uh, well, not just defend Walt, I guess, in his future endeavors, but, but also guide him and give him advice on how to sort of uh, navigate the uh, choppy waters of criminality. The netherworld. Not, the netherworld. Just, not just a criminal <laughs> lawyer, a criminal lawyer. Yeah, that's a great line that Jesse has. Yeah, Aaron delivers that so beautifully. Yeah, that's a great line. So, Vince, you were telling uh, me a little bit before we started this about uh, how you guys came up with the character of Saul Goodman. Yeah, we, we knew we wanted a, uh, you know, Walt to have this, this extra help. We knew at a certain point his business was going to get big enough that he was going to need some outside help. So then the question was, what are we going to name this character? And I, I remember coming into work one day having thought of the name Saul Good in the shower, uh, as in it's all good, Saul Good, G-O-O-D-E. But then Jay Roberts, one of our writers, said, how about Saul Goodman? It's all good, man. So, uh, you know, and, and as he describes it in the episode, as Saul Goodman describes it, this is a, this is a made-up name he puts on, uh, in his mind, to make uh, his clientele happy. So uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's passing. He's, uh, he's, he's pretending to be Jewish, and he's not really. Yes. That's, you know. Uh, and that's I, I knew that was that was one of the reasons I wanted to get that I wanted to get this episode because uh, you know he's he's uh, he's passing he's uh, he's an ethnic chameleon and I, I found that kind of intriguing yeah <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about how you how you got uh, Bob Odenkirk I know you're a big fan of his I'm a big fan of Bob's from from way back as is Peter and uh, yeah uh, Peter's wife, Nora, actually uh, had the idea that we should hire Bob. I think she was one of the first. I think somebody else independently mentioned his name, but it turns out Nora had mentioned Bob Odenkirk to Peter even before uh, the name came up elsewhere. She wrote me a list. That's he was, right. He was the first one on the list. Because he, uh, for those of you guys uh, who, who aren't familiar with Bob, for about 10 or 15 years ago, he had a show with David Cross on HBO called Mr. Show that was hilarious. It was sketch comedy. And, uh, man, I just I bought all the DVDs of that thing. I just love that show. And getting to work with him was a real treat. And Bob was also, he was a writer on Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah, he was, right. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's directed features. Yeah. You know, he's the, the guy is, is multi-talented. That is true. And I, I was just really thrilled that he, he was excited to do the show. And yeah. he, he and Now, I believe he took the job sight unseen. You know, he had like a thumbnail a uh, description of the character, but no script. I don't Is that think right? we. I think that's true. I, I don't think we had sent him the script yet because uh, you were still writing it. But uh, we we had to get you know as much in advance as possible. We had to we had to get him to say yes or somebody to say yes. And uh, I got on the phone with him. He wanted me to talk him through the the character. I remember one of the first things he says was, you know, I'm the character's name is Saul Goodman. He's this Jewish lawyer. I'm, I'm, I'm not Jewish. I said, no, that's, that's perfect, actually. <laughs> and then he said that one of his first uh, things he was interested in talking about was Saul's hair. <laughs> he had a very specific <laughs> image in his mind of what Saul's hair would look like. You know, and the, uh, our hair department did such a great job of extending his hair in the back. I don't know if you could tell there. Oh, that's extensions. not his hair. Oh, I, no, it's I not. thought it was. No, those. That's a that's a weave or something. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. Did, they and he was very concerned that uh, that a show that yeah. it looked right. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's you know that was sort of the first building block. And then you know then the costume I think was also something that yes. was very very important. But he started he started with the hair. He said I, I want a I don't want a mullet, but I want a quasi mullet. <laughs> you know you know business in the front, party in the back, but I, but not a, not a full on mullet. I want to uh, I want to and it was he was very specific and very articulate about it in a way that I can't uh, recreate now. But it was like I just it's got to be in the back. It's got to come down, but it's got to kind of it's got to have a <laughs> he saw it very clearly. That was uh, that was interesting. Well, what, I wanted to also bring up uh, his interesting office. Um, oh yeah. When, I, when yeah. I first saw his office, I'm like, okay, this is. I mean, this is quite an interesting set. So I'm wondering if you guys could 
talk a little bit about uh, the production design. Well, we early on we loved the idea that he was in a in a strip mall, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we with a big balloon on the top. I don't know. That came a little later, things. but that you know, what, what kind of places usually use those? You, there's always some you know inflatable gorilla on the roof of a <laughs> of a new Seven Eleven that's opened, or I, you know, not a Seven Eleven, but like a like Quickie Mart, or what, what usually you don't usually think of a law firm. You know, advertising with a giant inflatable, uh, you know, Statue, Statue of Liberty. Liberty. He's taking a used car sales techniques and yeah, bringing you, them to the legal, legal world. That's really. exactly what it is, of course. You use the big uh, inflatable blue gorilla on top of your used car establishment. But usually not, you know, in terms of uh, fine... Uh, you know, jurisprudence or whatever. <laughs> well, he, he turns out, I mean, he turns out to be surprisingly competent. That is... Actually, he's an effective, he's a pretty effective lawyer in his world. That is actually a very good point that uh, Peter makes. Uh, Saul is an easy guy to underestimate between his late night commercials and his uh, inflatable uh, Statue of Liberty and his bus benches, but he is actually going to he may just turn out to be, uh, there may turn out to be more to this guy than you think. He's, a, he's actually a pretty good lawyer, too. As Actually, he's not, a, he's not a good lawyer, as in a good person or moral, <laughs> or, or abiding by the standards of, uh, you know, uh, the judicial branch of the United States or any of that, but he's actually very savvy. He's a very smart guy. He knows how to play the system. Uh, one, of, uh, one of our writers on the staff, George Masters, is, is an attorney. I, I, I think he'd be, That's right. he'd be horrified to know that uh, we <laughs> disclosed that. And so he was able to throw in a few things there. I think he was a... Uh, but didn't we always say, George, now I know you wouldn't do this, wouldn't but, do but if you were going to do it, how would you do it? And George, George was a defense attorney, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah, George, George did a lot. <laughs> Who did he wow. work with? Big lawyer... Uh, when we get George, we're doing these a little out of order now, but we'll, when we get George to do uh, one, we'll ask him about that. Why? What's wrong? <laughs> I'm, I'm letting out the secrets. We're doing these out of order. <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. Don't peek at the man behind the curtain. That's yeah. the whole point of the podcast, is the, uh, to see, uh, get a peek at the man behind the curtain right. and then oh. call the police and have him arrested. Hey, talk about the, um, uh, you were on the set for the uh, the TV commercial, right? Wouldn't right. They? Yeah. Well, that you know, it was the, the funny thing about the TV commercial. From my perspective, we had pitched that commercial so many times. I had this. Is, this became sort of. A, this is before there was Saul we, Goodman. Well, no. When we were when we were working on the episode, for some reason, I, I think this from my perspective, we would always go back to that, and I'd always think to myself, "Well, I know the commercial's good." So I, whenever we got stuck, I would just pitch the commercial yeah. again. <laughs> and uh, and it, what amazed me was how quickly it shot. It, uh, oh, yeah, it, really? It just, you know, it was just bam, bam, bam. And, you know, we had all these uh, wonderful, funny, uh, they were all local actors in uh, Albuquerque uh, who we brought in. Yeah. Uh, but they were all, you know, they were in and done, each of them probably in about half an hour. Yeah. Uh, so it was, there, were, there was that, and there was also a lot of uh, Saul Goodman green screen. The one thing that we do have that I think is really a treasure that I'm hoping ends up on the DVD are all the things that Bob did on that commercial that we couldn't use because I think there's probably 15, 20 minutes of improv and he's, he's there. He doesn't break character. He kind of starts directing the camera in character as Saul Goodman. (laughs) And he's, and, and he he started, and there were times when he was kind of going off his lines as Saul Goodman. And it was, it was really, I think it's some, some pretty spectacular stuff that I, I hope, becomes publicly available. I remember Kathleen DeToro, our wonderful costume designer, uh, was quite nervous in advance uh, about how exactly is the guy's suit going to break off and you're going to reveal the black and white striped prison garb underneath. And right. How do you want this to break away? Do you want to break away in the middle? Does it come apart, I don't know, top and bottom? Does it... <laughs> Would you guys hooked up like little fish lines yeah. and pull it... It was on... It was Velcro together well, it was something? That was a, a brilliant piece that Kathleen and her team did uh, and it did it did it, it pulled apart instantly and it went back to even more importantly it yeah. went back together yeah, right. instantly <laughs> because you know you have to do a, a number of takes, of takes. Yeah. Uh, and the one piece that didn't always work perfectly was the hat coming down on his head sometimes <laughs> and that, I think that was sort of the uh, 
the comic highlight of that was the fact that the the prisoner's hat sails in from the top, and that <laughs> yeah. took a, quite quite a few takes to get right. I think was that like a guy with a fishing pole off yes. camera? Yes, yes, <laughs> I was. I believe Dennis Dennis Peterson with a fishing pole. There you go. <laughs> so wow. you guys you guys started this episode with um, a, a nice interesting little shot here. Uh, I remember reading the script and it said uh, that this would be nice to play in a, what we call a oneer. And uh, for those of you out there, a oneer is uh, just what it sounds like. It means there are no cuts in the camera. It's the whole scene plays in, in one shot. Um, and I thought it was really cool. And so I remember when uh, Skip McDonald uh, cut this episode, uh, I remember watching just this part of it when he brought the dailies in, and I thought it was really interesting. And then a couple of uh, weeks ago, I watched the final version, and I'm like, wow, you guys you guys have some tricks up your sleeve with this one that, you and know, if you're, no not, if, you, if, yeah, if you're not looking for them, uh, even if you are looking for them, you got to have a pretty keen eye to tell. So uh, do you guys want to talk about uh, yeah. the little tricks that you have in there? Well, I, before you talk about the tricks, the one thing I do want to say, uh, to give credit to, to DJ Qualls and uh, Matt Jones, who are doing the scene, they did the scene Perfect. perfectly. Perfectly. That, that we have, that we have uh, take after take of them really yeah. killing in this scene. Yeah. So any editing tricks... Uh, uh, are due to us, not due to them. Well, no, that's a very good point you make, Peter. Uh, we conceived of this, as, as Kelly said, as like a little mini play. You know, you and Terry, you know, Terry, uh, you were there on the day when this was shot, and Terry covered it, you know, in the classic belt and suspenders fashion. He covered it from different angles so that we could cut into it as need be. And Matt and uh, DJ did, as you said, a great job without a flaw. They, they ran it like a little play because this thing is like five pages long, mm-hmm. this scene. Do you know how many takes there were? How many takes were there? Uh, you know, surprisingly on this one there weren't that many takes. What was interesting to me was that Terry moved heaven and earth to make sure the guys arrived a day early. Yes. And so he got a little extra. They arrived on, a, I think, a, we were shooting. A, my memory is we shot on a Monday, and he had them come in on a Saturday instead of Sunday so he could work with them yeah. at the hotel. And so they ran the scene... <laughs> And by the time they got to the set, they were doing a great job. But then another thing that he and Michael Slovis, the DP, did was that they shot all the coverage first. So they did all the the closer angles that Vince is talking about and the raking singles and all that. That was all done. And so it was almost as if they had Which is that out of much order. more rehearsed. That was that's, out of order. That's absolutely the way, the opposite of what you usually do. Yes, usually so, you work from the, lo- the wider shots in closer. Yeah. So basically you're saying that when I read it, it was supposed to be a one but just to protect yourselves, you guys decided you wanted to shoot coverage, medium shots, close-up shots, yeah. just, just in case. Yeah. Absolutely. And then we were in the editing room, and we knew we had something good because we had – probably did you guys did two or three takes of that master maybe mm-hmm. and, and we had they were all of them really good really well executed by the two actors but as peter said through no fault of theirs the scene kind of felt a little long and uh because it was it was like a five five and a half page scene and so we're watching it and watching it and watching it over and over again peter and i and skip mcdonald the editor and the question inevitably arises, well, should we go into coverage here and cut out this little bit here, this little bit of business here, despite the great job the actors are doing? It's not really that funny. You know, maybe do we do we get rid of this? Do we cut out that? And Skip had the great idea of uh, there, there's, there's actually what we did. We cut in this one-er, uh, which was five and a half minutes long, whatever, we cut probably a minute and a half out of this thing. Mm-hmm by uh, Skip very artfully uh, taking the wipes, what we call the wipes, the passers-by, uh, the people on foot, the pedestrians walking in front of the camera and wiping through frame. He very carefully cut them out, uh, made you know mats of them, as it were, in the Avid, in our editing, computerized editing system, and wiped them through the frame and used their bodies to hide the fact that we were cutting out 10, 20, 30 seconds at a, at a whack. And there's, so, there's so basically when uh, a pedestrian walks by, th- behind them, Matt and, and DJ or Badger and this, this policeman, undercover cop, have changed takes. Yeah. Oh no, they, it's all the same take actually. Oh, it, and that's oh, right. It oh, is it all is. the same. Just take. Cut out a few seconds out of the one take. That's right. Oh, oh, it is oh. So it take. is the same yeah. take it that is. you used of them because they, they, they were that good. It we is. didn't. Oh, okay. And also, it has you know f- that's one of the things I think gives the scene a flow 
to it yeah. is it is one take. Yeah. And so that when the other thing that's sort of funny about it, and you you know, those of you who are listening to the podcast, if you're like if you're like me, you're running to your DVR right now and looking at this frame by frame. Yeah. I challenge you to find these because they're buried in the middle of all these other wipes of people and cars going back and forth. Yeah, not every person who walks past indicates a cut. Those people walking past were in the footage anyway. Uh, Terry McDonough had them walking through the shot every now and then, had them spaced out. But every now and then, we used one of them, or or, or we, we placed one in a spot where we wanted a cut. And if you look real close... You can probably find it, but we're not going to tell you where they are. But there's like three or four of them, right? So you're offering a prize? Nah, we're, for, <laughs> <laughs> whoever <laughs> finds the finds them all. What are they saying? Click and clack. Administer yourself a, a warm pat on the back. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> At a boy. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, Skip did a hell of a job with that. It was just really impressive. Uh, isn't it yeah. funny though that that, that uh, we're talking about a shot or scene that looks like it has no editing at all? Yeah, and, and yet the editor has done such a tremendous oh, amount yeah. to to shape it and to make it make it as a, you know more entertaining. Yeah, the three of us were in that room just in that one unedited shot. Seemingly, we were in the room editing that thing for for almost a day, <laughs> or t- most of a day. It was yeah, but uh, those guys did a great job. DJ and Matt, really really uh, fun watching them work. You guys brought up something that I wanted to talk about, um, and it just occurred to me as I was listening. Um, how much uh, how much rehearsal is usually done on stuff like this? I don't think people realize that you know there's not a whole lot of rehearsal that gets done, especially in television. You know, I know that actors probably wish there was more. I know that everybody wishes there was more time, but how much rehearsal usually does get done on our show? Not not as much as sometimes we'd like, uh, but we're we're no different as you just said than than any other TV show. You're running for your life on a TV show, uh, trying to get everything shot in a, in the very little amount of time that you have, and uh, it's it's sort of rare that uh, the actors really get to rehearse a scene. Uh, although a couple of times this season, uh, for a scene like this one, which we wanted to play as a wonder, or for some really big uh, dramatic moments we've got coming up which I won't talk too much about the actors uh, and the director have uh, on several occasions found the time to get together on the weekend which is asking a lot of of the crew and the actors especially uh, you know the folks who've come in the folks who are working on the show day in and day out for them to give up even two or three hours on a weekend is you know they always do it cheerfully there's never any any grumbling or groaning because they like the rest of us they want the very best show that they can possibly muster just uh you know kind of clarify what kind of gets done in in a nutshell on television show is you know the show will will shoot the actual camera will roll on one episode for eight days and in that eight days the whole show gets shot and right after on day number nine the next episode comes right in for their eight days Mm Um, and what happens, too, is um, on most shows, there is a different director for every episode. Uh, I know there are shows out there that sometimes will shoot two episodes at the same time, so they will have one one director for two episodes. But on our show, it's one director for every episode. Yeah, that's, and that's what, called cross-boarding. Or, oh, okay. When you, when you have, we did that actually one time. Adam Bernstein, wonderful director who also does two episodes for us this season, directed our first two episodes of season one and we cross-boarded them it means it requires that you have the two scripts ready to go on day one of prep and you schedule the whole thing out in this case like a movie and because you've got two hours you know pretty much movie length of story and you figure out okay there's a scene scene number 14 and episode one we can shoot along with scene number 28 in episode 2, and we'll shoot these, them all in one These day. are not real scene numbers or episodes. Yeah, I just make it up. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. It's it's basically you shoot little bits and pieces uh, of both episodes in, in any one given day, and that's how you get through it. And a lot of TV shows, well, some TV shows out there, are really brilliant about doing that week in and week out and making the most of their time. And I tell you, as a, as a showrunner, I hear about showrunners that pull that off I don't know how they do it because, it, as I said, it requires that you have two scripts ready to go on one day, the right. first day of prep, and getting one script ready to go in good shape on the first day of prep in any given moment in the, in the season, especially toward the latter part of the season, is just about impossible. So how do you, <laughs> how you get two of them ready to go so you can cross-board them? I don't know. How, the only reason we did it that one time is because we had 
it was our first episode. We had you know months leading in, right. weeks, weeks leading in. That was after the pilot. though. That was the first episode after the pilot. <clears throat> the pilot is its own creature. It's its own thing. It, you know, we had a a lot of the crew stayed around for the TV show, but that felt like a whole different crew. We had a different director of photography. About was, six months between the, when it was actually shot to when to when we start. I think yeah. you, you started shooting the pilot in February, and we didn't start shooting. Uh, the first episode until the middle of September. Hmm. Yeah, is that, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I got a bad memory for dates, but that sounds right. Just to, I guess, further illustrate that is, you, you basically will have a director uh, will come in. Let's say, let's say this director, Terry McDonough, he came in when episode. This is episode number two hundred eight. Uh, Terry McDonough, who's shooting 208, actually came in to start prepping the episode when on the first day of episode 207. So that director is basically busy for eight days before his episode is shooting, prepping, looking at locations, uh, having production meetings, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then he will start shooting uh, episode 208. And at that point, uh, the person who's directing 209 will come in and start prepping. So it's kind of like a, it's almost like a runaway train. It, it just keeps going. And all the while... Um, Our writer's room is also working. The writers are also working constantly trying to make sure that they stay ahead of the episodes that are actually prepping. And Vince has to keep track of every single bit of it. (laughs) Well, you know, I have help. I have you guys. But, yeah, we all tell in this very serialized story. We all have to put our brains into high gear and try to remember. Now, wait a minute. You know, is didn't, aren't we forgetting something that happened three episodes back and you know yada 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 and also uh, what you left out Kelly is uh, meanwhile you you and Lynn and Skip I was just going to get to that <laughs> yeah, you're all editing at the same time so yeah. we're at any given moment uh, you know a few episodes into the season the, sort of the solid days of the beginning of the season when production hadn't even started yet we have time to fine tune the scripts and all that but uh, once you get into once things really get rolling you are in pre-production and production and post-production all in any one given hour of the day you're at the same time we're all we're all working you're prepping an episode you're figuring out an episode somebody's off writing an episode you're giving notes on the script and then at the me- in the meantime you're shooting the previous episode and at the meantime two episodes back is the one the editors are cutting and you're it's it's you know it's amazing tv it's you know whether you wh- keep in mind there's tv shows you guys watch out there there's tv shows you love hopefully ours knock on wood there's tv shows you hate but any of us we all have what we love and what we hate it's astounding the amount of work that goes into making a tv i can't even believe that we i'm not i don't mean us i mean any tv show i don't believe you, you know even, pull it off even the worst well <laughs> it, it sounds very self-congratulatory i don't mean it that way i'm just tv in general i don't know how it works I mean, even the worst TV show you ever saw that you hate, you can't believe how hard those people work to get it on the air. It's astonishing. I, I can't, you know, I, I'm amazed. Well, I, you know, the other perspective I'd give you on that is I think uh, everybody who works on the show, me included, you, you realize how much work it is, and then you say, wow, but we're working on something really special that's really clicking, and you can feel it clicking. And I think that that's one of the things that happens. Everybody gives, you know, just a little bit more or uh, you know, you, that's you're really getting the best of everybody because it's not just hard work and God knows what the results are going to be. You can just feel it kind of clicking and being special. Yeah, or at least just, I, you know, that's that's how I feel. Now we all get tunnel vision. You got to believe what you're working on is special, whether it is or it isn't. You got to mm-hmm. believe it. Otherwise, I don't know how you get through the day. But, well, uh, but, but in this case, it really is. <laughs> it's not self-deception. Well, it's yeah. funny. I, I didn't mean to get off too much onto a tangent. Um, I think it's kind of, I guess, you know, a lot of people don't really understand how it works, but I only wanted to mention it because of the amount of rehearsal or the lack of rehearsal. We really have to rely on the fact that, you know, our actors are here and they came to play. And Oh, yeah. Well, you, know, that's, and, that you said it right there. I mean, Kelly, it's the reason we don't have to have rehearsals. You know, everyone would like them, I think. Brian and Anna and, and, and Aaron, all, and all Dean, Betsy, RJ, everybody would like rehearsals. There, you know, there's a little bit of a blocking rehearsal that you go through for yeah. every new scene. But but I that sure. happens the day of. That happens no, that an happens hour the, before they're going to roll. That happens five minutes before they're going to roll most <laughs> of the time. And uh, I think they'd love more prep time if they could have it. But, you know, we live or die on, on our actors, on our, on our, on our cast. And, and thank God we got such fine actors who get it done, and you know, it's amazing to watch Brian, just for instance, uh, all, all of them are, are so wonderful. But you watch Brian, you're sitting there, you know, BSing with him on the set, and he's mm-hmm. talking about 
the way the Dodgers played the night before, and he's goofing around, telling jokes with the uh, assistant camera operator or whatever, and suddenly somebody calls rolling, and it's like suddenly he's a different person. I mean, in a in a nanosecond, he's a different person. He's got such he's you know he's got such chops. You know, he's been doing it long enough, and he's got such skill and talent. So talent is sort of God given, but the skill he earned over many decades of work, and as did the rest of our actors, and and they really put it to good use. So when someone calls rolling, and boom, all of a sudden he's Walter White, because Brian Cranston and Walter White are two very different people. But mm-hmm. man, he can turn it on and off. I don't know how they do it. It's amazing. Well, jumping back to episode two hundred eight, a couple of episodes ago we met uh, our new uh, lead. Well, not I guess not leading lady. She's Jesse's leading lady, though. She's uh, yeah, Kristen uh, Ritter. Uh, Kristen Ritter, actually, Jane. Kristen Ritter. Yeah. Um, and in this episode, uh, basically, this is the first time they they kind of hook up, right? That's right. Well, they've hooked up, you know, sort of in between. The, you know the fade out of the previous episode and the fade into this one. Yeah, so. I really like how you put the commercial. I, uh, Jesse's satellite that was searching in the last episode, we left it searching, is now he's now has now finished searching and is uh, broadcasting Saul's commercial. Well, you know, I think a lot of this comes out of the fact that a number of us in the writers' room were thinking about getting flat screen TVs, uh, <laughs> plasma or LCD. Yeah, well, that, that, uh, plasma. In, the blacks in, are better in, in plasma. 20, in two hundred five, uh, you heard some of that conversation. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's 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 becomes a becomes a, mo- a running motif, you yeah. know, in, in the episode. Now, did you want to write a sex scene, or were you bummed out when we said, "Nah, let's just cut cut to the afterglow"? Uh, you know, I, be honest. I, 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 I'm I'm hung up enough <laughs> that, that, that I, I wouldn't mind writing it if I if I didn't have to be there while they were shooting it. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, the, you know yeah. I, but uh, Kristen was you know she's just she's great, she's tremendous, yeah. and the rapport that she and Aaron had yeah. was was uh, really something to see. And it's I, I I I'm really I'm really proud of the you know the fact that this is you know you start finding out. That these two have had a sense of connection, and now you start seeing where some of that connection might be coming from, and that she's, yeah. you know, that she's that she's in recovery. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, some of the, you know, maybe uh, maybe there's a reason she, you know, you know, maybe she's drawn to him for a whole lot of reasons, and I think that's 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 kind of interesting. Like a moth to a flame. Yes. Well. <laughs> maybe there's no. We got. I think uh, suffice it to say, and not to be too coy, but we got some interesting stuff coming up with. With those two, and they are great together, aren't they? Yeah, they, got, they really are. You know, honest to God, no pun intended, but they have great chemistry together. Yeah. Those two, they really, they truly do. She's, she's, she's real sweet. She's, uh, like I mentioned in another podcast, uh, again, she came to us. Bialy and Thomas are, are uh, Sharon Bialy and Sherry Thomas are wonderful casting ladies. Uh, turned us on to her. I have to admit, I'd never, I was not familiar with her before they. They brought her into us, and uh, boy, Kristen is great. Now I believe she has her own show. She does. I think she's. I think we spin off of. I don't forget the title, but it's on the CW. I think spin off of the Gossip Girl. Yeah, she's yeah. going to star in it. I think she's going to star in it. Well, she should star in it, whether whatever it is, because she's she's got the chops. I think she's going to be a star. Well, it really is something to see the, 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 the cast put these. How quickly they put these scenes together, and how great they are. Actually, my I, I love the first scene with the, the two of them, but my my favorite scene is the one at the very end of the episode. Where uh, they're flirting about Jesse's uh, Jesse's new bed. Oh, that's and we're, a great we're one. starting to see. Uh, you know, we're starting to see. We're starting to see his uh, his apartment kind of come together here. Yeah, it really pulled the room together. Yes, it did. It did <laughs> the bed, and you know, I I I, always, I just found it. You know, yeah, yeah, just yeah. really. I, I liked how they got together. That was a great. I remember having some little minor freak out about. I said it has to be goddamn king sized. I think it was a queen size or something. It's the other way around. Or, or I it think had you be... asked for a queen and it and was, was a king. king or well anyway. It's like a it's, full, it's, I think, if nothing it, else. This just full. shows you the, this shows you the level that we you know, this we're talking about detail. These these are the details that we live and die on, you know, is the bed a king size or a queen size. Yeah, you can kill a whole afternoon with that argument. <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, listen, where do we go to lunch? That takes another yes. three hours. I kept arguing for a water bed. But a uh, water bed is good. You know, we gave Mulder a water bed on the X Files, and uh, for the first, we did nine years in that show. For the first five or six, or even seven years, we never showed his bedroom, and then we gave him a water bed. So I, I didn't feel like I could properly do a water bed. 
and then it See, broke. Ev- and then it broke. Everything's been done on the X Files. That's what. That's yeah, one of the things yeah. I've learned from working on our show. Yeah. Oh. Well, I gotta say though, Peter, one of my very favorite scenes in the show um, is when uh, Walt actually talks to Hank. Um, I really, really liked it. One that's of my a great favorite. Scene. It's got one of my favorite pieces of dialogue in it where it just tells them to, you know, kick life in the ass. <laughs> but my, I, I really love the line where it basically said, you know, you and I don't have really ex- experiential overlap or something like that. And I was like, oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> That is a great scene. You were there that day, right? I was there that day. And that was uh, spe- rewarding to me also because I had written uh, another scene between Walt and Hank from the first season, the last episode, where they, the cigar scene where they're talking about what's legal and what's not legal. Yeah. And I didn't get to be there. I was I yeah. was, I was, was on a picket line That's when right. that was shot. That's right. Uh, and this time I got to be there when these to watch these two guys work together on the scene, and it was, it was, it was really That was one special. of my favorite scenes of last year, actually. That, that one there, that... That was a really solid scene, talking about, uh, you know, what's legal, what's, you know, because it all starts because uh, Hank has brought Cuban cigars to, to, to Walt's party, which are, of course, illegal in the United States, and, you know, the line of what's legal, and it's always shifting, what's legal, what's illegal. That was a good scene. Yeah, and this scene is is a, is a good, uh, it's not an immediate follow-up or anything like that, but it's sort of reminiscent of that, these two guys sort of mm-hmm. being honest with each other. Well, they're as honest as yeah. Walt can get. Yeah. Well, their relationships changed, you know. Yeah, it's, it is. It's very, it's it's different, and it's. I mean, one of the things I, the rings for me. This, I was having terrible insomnia while we were working on this on this episode. Are you nervous? Uh, yeah, I was. I was. I was falling apart. I had insomnia, and so and so that whole line about falling, waking up at three o'clock in the morning. That was all. That was all right out of my life. Yeah. <laughs> so I was. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was really. I was really. Uh, I was really happy that that, that ended up coming through. And, and of course, um, the wow. way Brian. The way Brian reads the line. He he. To have him do dialogue that you've written that means something to you, you feel like, uh, wow, that's how I really feel. Why can't I express myself that way? And that's part of the joy. Of, you did of getting, though. <laughs> I, I did, but you know why? Why, why can't, can't you do it? Why talking? can't I sound like that in real life? You know why? Because if you. Were that uh, if the words rolled off your tongue that easily as they roll out of your computer, you'd be satisfied enough that you wouldn't need to write, and therefore you wouldn't be writing, and you'd be off working at H and R Block or something like that. Nothing <laughs> wrong with working at H and R Block. Yes. The that's fine not, people, that's not my the point. fine people at H and R Block. The fine people. No, they. Uh, my point being that writers yes. are are not the happiest lot you can ever find yourselves in the company of. They are not particularly super happy. I think I read like some quote last year about something like, you know, what what do writers do every morning? You get up and you just open a vein or something like that and just, you know, write. I mean, you just kind of like bang against your forehead until the the blood drops on the paper. I don't know why it should be that way. It does feel that way. And then you catch yourself feeling all mopey and like, you know, I have to open a vein. I have to let out the secret contents of my brain onto the page. <laughs> you know, I, I must share this with the world. It's just, it's, we're just telling stories. It's just, yeah. uh, don't get all bent out of shape about it. And yet, I don't know. It's just whatever. Well, let me ask you guys um, also, getting into like the philosophical part of our podcast, which always happens. Um, uh, Walt is getting pretty aggressive. He's getting very, very aggressive, especially with Jesse. Um, happened uh, before and. Um, I think in episode uh, 205 when uh, he tells Jesse to handle it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, um, and now he's also, uh, we've got a problem. Badger has been arrested. Right. Um, Jesse didn't know, and Jesse, you know, you can even tell when uh, Jesse's on the phone, I think, to Combo, and he says, you know, don't, don't, don't cover for him, man. You know, you can tell mm-hmm. that's all an act that he's doing for Walt, but, mm-hmm. you know, he finds out, and, you know, he's afraid to tell him and stuff like that. But Walt is, Walt is becoming you know, quite aggressive and, and on the offense with Jesse and saying, you know, I mean, Walt is making Jesse change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it really, it's a seesaw that goes back and forth where, you know, whereas in, in 205, Jesse was kind of laying down the law mm-hmm. and calls him Walt for the first time. Yeah. And then, you know, he goes through what he goes through. I think that's the only time that I've ever seen him. I don't know if he's yeah. done it before. No. It's certainly. No. And boy, Walt made him pay for that one. Huh? Yeah, he sure did. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, but, the, and, I've, I've lost that thought, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know it's it's uh, you know it just leads me to think of something I'm thinking about a lot lately. I mean, we're so proud of where this season goes, but you know, in some ways, this sounds like a hippy dippy thing to say, but Walt kind of writes himself, at least in my mind. He kind of 
not just Walt, but Skyler and Jesse and, and uh, Marie and Hank and, and Walt Jr., they all kind of tell you, if you listen closely enough, in other words, if we writers sit in a room long enough and talk about the characters long enough to one another, the characters kind of sort of tell you where they need to go. Well, At least su- it feels that way. They surprise me. Yeah. They surprise me. I mean, I was stunned when, uh, when Walt and Jesse kidnapped Saul. That, yeah. was, that was one of those things. It was one of those, you know, we had, we had basically backed them into a corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we had come up with 55 million things that they could do at that point. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then they end, up, they end up kidnapping the guy at gunpoint. But I love that scene. To... Well, talk, talk about how, co- oh, I'm sorry, finish When he's stuff. like starting to speak Spanish, that's great. Well, you know, I think part of, part, I think one of the things that was uh, on our minds was that the, the season is really, this is a dark season. There's a lot of very heavy, heavy stuff happening. And we, yeah. one, not, not on a, purpose, but not it just on sort of turned out just, that way. It's, yeah. it's a, well, it's, it's, uh, it's organic. Yeah. Well, it kind of had and this, to. And this yeah. episode, I think this episode kind of is, is tonally, uh, it was a little bit, a little bit different. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit a little different lighter. and a little bit lighter, yeah. and uh, that was something that I think we worked really hard to still make it feel like the show and feel right, but also go a little bit lighter for this episode, especially considering where well, we're going. Well, I tell you, I, I love the lightness. Uh, I love the humor. I, lightness, maybe the word, maybe not, but I love the humor of this episode. But I tell you, anyone who's not in it for the humor, you know that scene that saves it all. That's a weird way to put it. There's nothing here that needs saving in your episode. You did yeah. such a great job on. But that scene we were talking about a minute ago with with Walt and mm-hmm. and Hank, that's a that's a pretty serious. I love it the is. I love the thoughtfulness of that scene. You did a great job on that scene. Well, what's so great? I mean, that's I hear we'll pat ourselves on the back for a minute. But one of the things I like about the show is that you just you don't know which way it's going to go. You know, yeah. and there's and there's always that there's always this kind of zigzag. Yeah. That uh, it, it is, I'm always surprised by it. I mean, I've been stunned by some of the things that have happened. Talk about how cold it was that day. That that scene where they're they've kidnapped Saul and they've got the shallow grave out. The, <laughs> oh, how far oh. was that from Houston? That was within again within was, about a half mile. right? Yeah, this is this is again this is uh, this is this is close. We staying close to Q Studios, but there was Q Studios is out in the desert essentially. Yeah. And uh, Terry McDonough, the director, uh, uh, he scouted this location, which is like a huge. There was a huge depression in the desert that had been, I think, dug out for for some purpose. They're going to build houses or an underground tank or something. And so we found this wonderful place, and we decided to shoot at least the beginning of it at what we call Magic Hour, which is just when the sun sets and there's still a little bit of light in the sky. And uh, those are the wide shots. Yes, those right? are the wide shots. Yeah. And, uh, and so, the, and I think those came out just spectacular. Oh yeah, Mike Slovis, great and job. It, it was a beautiful, warm day, and it had the uh, the weather had been great in Albuquerque. And then suddenly, as soon as we came in and really started shooting the scene, the wind started, and it it kicked up the sand, and the sand got into the equipment, and uh, lights started falling over. And the little tent they have for the uh, for the video monitors went flying, and it was. Yeah. But it wasn't just sand going through the air; it was cold. It was yeah. freezing cold, and it was fl- throwing sand in the actors' eyes, oh, in everybody's up their noses, in their mouths, and uh, at the Albuquerque crew all suddenly produced uh, goggles. Anybody who was in from LA <laughs> had no goggles, and so. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of us were asking. So where'd you get the goggles? But uh, so Terry and I ended up huddling inside the RV, yeah, uh, watching watching this over a little Hugging monitor. Each other for warmth. We, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the but like the play one of great, it, it was like some kind of play. I don't know. And uh, the uh, but the the whole cast, the, the, the three the three of them out there, they were in between each take. There was a lot of spitting. And pulling sand out of their ears and their eyes and everything, and uh, but the, other, the thing was, I never heard a single complaint. Yeah, from I never, anybody yeah. on the crew yeah. or anybody in the cast. And boy, you know, I I was so glad when we saw the dailies of the scene that you can actually see the wind whipping around. Yeah, and one of the things that I that was not a wind machine. That was not a wind machine. Yeah. And Bob was concerned before the scene shot. He said, "You know, can we get a wind machine so that my hair flaps around?" Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he, he wanted he wanted his hair to fly around and. Man, his hair is flying. We didn't need a wind machine. That, that hair is flying around like crazy. I love, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's makeup or if it's just really just snot underneath his nose. But I love <laughs> I love that shiny that shiny patch under his nose in the close-ups. It's worth seeing on a big screen. <laughs> it is. But those guys are great in that scene. I'm, 
I'm so glad I wasn't there that night. It you, just sounded miserable. You should be. That was that was and that was the that was the last thing we shot for the episode. Which, which oh, it was yeah. that was the last bit. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, one more thing I want to ask you guys about. I remember when I read this episode. Um, it's funny because you you guys have used kind of a, a conventional. Uh, get in front of them, you know, kind of a bait and switch kind of thing going on with with the the, the drug, you know, the 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 what do they call the big, it the, the big swap, yeah, the, the big, big swap, swap. The yeah, big the, the yeah. Big... But I remember seeing it a few weeks ago at the mix, and I've been, I remember being really pleasantly surprised because it does not come off. It doesn't come off like one of these conventional ones. It's really nice, and one of the nice things too about it is I love the music choice that you made. Music choice, I tell you, we are so blessed. We've got. Dave Porter, who's our composer, who does who who writes original music for us and does a wonderful job, and we've got Thomas Goljevic, Thomas G. We call him because his last name I'm not sure I'm even getting it right, but Thomas it's, G. Who is uh, a real pro at uh, his he's so good at uh, um, finding uh, uh, songs, existing songs. He's a DJ and he also uh, was the music supervisor on Six Feet Under before he came to work with us. And he found a song, and I'm drawing a blank now on the name, but it, he found, among many other wonderful songs he finds for us, he found that song that we use in the uh, mm-hmm. the dope, uh, dope deal scene. And I tell you, you know, you're right. I agree completely, Kelly. It was like, because we, we had heard a wonderful cue uh, Dave had written for it, and we're like, oh, that's really, really good. And then, well, let's listen to this uh, song Thomas sent us. And then you're like, holy crap. You know? It totally kind of, it, it, it's it's one of those things where it just you're not expecting it. It's so many. It's like so many things on this show where you know you just you just don't expect it. It goes against the grain. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's. I really like a lot of the music choices that Thomas brings in because yeah. they just totally are not what you expect on that kind of thing. He's got great taste. Both those guys, he and Dave, both yeah. have great taste. You were going to mention also uh, a little bit, Vince, just in closing, about the Aztec. We were talking a little bit about Walt's car. We could we could do a whole podcast on the Aztec. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, a good point. Uh, look closely in that scene when uh, Brian Cranston is quite a driver. He actually, he can hustle that uh, Aztec <laughs> around pretty well. And he, uh, if you look closely, he uh, when he makes that U-turn, uh, to go stop, uh, you know, the, the deal from going down wrong. He whips that thing in a Yui, and two times he gets the he gets the rear tire off the ground. <laughs> That's pretty. That was pretty impressive. Either it's really good driving, or it's a really bad car, or, or some mix of the two. Yeah, we had to butter. We had to butter the asphalt to make that happen. Is that also like the, yes. the old David uh, the David Lean trick in uh, Lawrence Arabia, where they put the steel plates underneath the train that's, to that's, make it go sliding off into the sand? That was exactly yes. Yeah. That was what we had in mind. Was David Lean? And you know, Terry is very much like David Lean. He's and a Brit, he's, and he's a Brit. So there you go. <laughs> we both drove on the left side of the road. Vince, how'd you right. come up with the Aztec? By the way. Well, no offense to the uh, to General Motors, but it is the ugliest car. Uh, well, it's not in production anymore, but it's the one of the ugliest cars ever produced uh, by this country or any other. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's perfect for Walt. Well, it's just you know, I, I have to say, it's distinctive. It's uh, it's and the, you know, actually, uh, to give credit where credit is due, you know, I've spent some time in in Walt's Aztec. And uh, there are a lot of actually interesting uh, design uh, tidbits. Well, like, wasn't it made to like go camping and? Yeah, stuff it's and... got cup holders in the in the in the tailgate built in, and it's got you know the center divider that you put your your rest your elbow on when you're driving doubles as a cooler. You pull the whole thing out, take it with you as a put ice in it as an ice chest. That's a cool design. I don't know why the rear end has to look like it does, but but you know. <laughs> what about the color? Well, the color, that is not uh, uh, a GM, official GM color. That is, uh, again, our, our wonderful, oh, we never did talk about the great, uh, our wonderful art director, Rob Wilson King, who gave us Saul Goodman's office, that crazy office with the uh, Constitution on the walls. <laughs> also uh, chose the uh, paint scheme for the Aztec and had it painted a very specific, very matte finished color, which is some sort of a cross between olive drab and, like dried cat poop, and, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's that that is not a color you find in nature or in the GM paint catalog. So, but Rob King, by the way, we need to talk about him more in another podcast. Great uh, production designer who really is integral to the look of our show, uh, along with uh, Mike Slovis, our wonderful director of photography. 
Well, guys, I guess that uh, we're about out of time here, and talk about uh, next time. Talk about uh, episode two hundred nine. I, I can't. I, I can't say enough about uh, Rob and Mike Slovis. Uh, they're, they're just. It's 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 fantastic to watch those two guys work, and I love the visual look of the show. And I, they they just do such. Fan, they do fantastic work. That is true. We're we're blessed to have them. Well, guys, so like I said, we're going to uh, meet up again, talk about episode 209, which is called Four Days Out. Four Days Out. Four Days Out. Oh, that was a fun one. So oh, boy. Thank you guys for coming in. You won't believe what you're going to see later in this season. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to knock you on your ass. Knock your eyeballs out. All right, All right guys. Thank so you, guys. Let's go break bad. <laughs>